start uh, this panel on the Monkey Watch. Kiana Ponyo from Catholic University of Trinidad and sharing uh, this session. Runner Price from IRCS uh, will moderate uh, this panel on Monkey Watch. Um, we will hear about Monkey Watch from a different perspective in this panel. Uh, one of them being the contractive perspective in, in the context of the Irish project. Then uh, also uh, we will hear uh, Jim Madden from the UK uh, Neighborhood Watch who will uh, talk about and explore the nature of Neighborhood Watch in a specific context, which is the British one, and he will provide um, an overview of Neighborhood Watch schemes uh, uh, in the UK and also a historical uh, overview of Neighborhood Watch, of neighborhood watch in the UK. And then uh, the last speaker is Joachim Kersten uh, from the German Police University. So we will have, again, another perspective on the watch from the German police, from the police view. Um, in, in the context of, uh, well, from the perspective of surveillance studies, uh, I think that neighborhood watch is particularly interesting uh, for at least two reasons. Um, the first one is the citizens are active surveillance, uh, surveillance agent, so, and this makes this practice of particular interest, I think. And the second one is that Neighborhood Watch can be also viewed as an example of uh, community-based uh, resilience in, res in response to localized problems uh, such as fear of crime. So it's quite an interesting uh, practice, surveillance practice. So I think that this morning we will have time to explore this topic from a different point of, of views. So I'll give the floor to the first uh, speaker, uh, who is Jean uh, Madden. Y you know that you have uh, from 10 to 12 minutes, and then at the end we will have time for, uh, we will take questions at the end. So, Jean. Thank you. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, for the past, last four years, I've been the chair of the Neighbourhood and Home Watch Network for England and Wales. A bit about how we're structured in a minute. I'm a retired police inspector, having served throughout London between 1968 and 1999. And I've been involved with Neighbourhood Watch in the UK for more than 20 years. Uh, for people looking out for their neighbours is nothing new. So, uh, you can see this is one of my favourite paintings. It's the Night Watch by Rembrandt. Hangs in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And it depicts uh, a group of uh, citizens led by Captain Franz Bannik-Kopp and Lieutenant Wilhelm van Reitenberg who are about to embark on their nightly patrol of the streets of Amsterdam. So it's looking out for our neighbors is nothing new. So, um, I just want to mention the broken window theory, which I'm sure many of you here are familiar with. It's a criminological theory on the norm setting and signaling effect of urban disorder and vandalism on additional crime and antisocial behaviour. The theory states that maintaining and monitoring urban environments to prevent small crimes such as vandalism, public drinking, begging, helps to create an atmosphere of order and lawfulness, thereby preventing more serious crimes from happening. However, there are some social barriers. In a recent survey in England and Wales, 53% of those questioned admitted they have deliberately stalled leaving their homes to avoid speaking to a neighbour. However, 65% believe that their neighbours would be stronger, their neighbourhoods would be stronger, if people were encouraged to get to know each other better. So how do we square the circle? A recent UK government survey showed that there is a downward trend in people who chat to their neighbours at least once a month. However, one of the benefits of knowing your neighbours is safer communities. So just to stand still, we need to be doing more to compensate for this. And like the broken window theory, Neighbourhood Watch was developed by the New York Police Department in 1982 
in response to the lack of information coming from the neighbours of Kitty Genovese <coughs> after she was murdered by one of her neighbours outside her home. The lack of reaction and shortage of information from her neighbours prompted a theory called the bystander effect, which I'm sure we can all relate to and have witnessed at some point in our lives. So as it says on the screen, crime cannot flourish in a community that cares. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Can you move on to the next one, please? Thank you. In 1982, the first neighbourhood watch was set up in England in Cheshire, just south of Manchester. It quickly spread to London and other parts of the country. The new watches had a lot of support from the local police, and their primary focus was tackling high levels of residential burglary. Watches were identified by street signs, and watch members placed stickers in their windows. They concentrated on crime prevention advice and target hardening, making sure that residents had proper locks and bolts on their doors and windows and that valuable property was marked in some way so that if it was stolen and recovered, it could be returned to the rightful owner. This approach has proved to be very successful. Homes were more secure and harder to break into, and the risk of burglars being identified and arrested increased and together, this had a significant impact on residential burglaries. Burglars went somewhere else. They knew they would have difficulty disposing of their loot. And there was a significant drop in residential burglary in, in able watch areas of between 16 and 26%. And it was reported in today's Danish press that there had been a 12.5% reduction in residential burglaries in the past year, which is directly attributable the expansion of Neighbourhood Watch, which in Denmark is named, known as Neighbour Help, Neighbour Help. Insurance companies <coughs> acknowledge this by giving discounts on home contents insurance, and their figures showed that a householder was six times less likely to be the victim of burglary if they were in a Neighbourhood Watch area than those who were not. And this figure rose to one in 20 if a proper crime prevention survey had been undertaken and the recommendations implemented. So the Neighbourhood Watch brand is very well known in England. In 1992, a survey showed that 94% of the people knew what it stood for, and by 20,000, that figure had risen to 99%. The schemes were started for a variety of reasons. For instance, if a, a burglary had taken place, Statistically, the chance of that house or a neighbouring house being broken into in the six, following six months was very high. The police would often set up a watch scheme using the location of the burglary as a focal point and concentrating on the 10 or 12 houses on either side. This was known as cocooning. Now, other people set up watches for different reasons. To get cheap home contents insurance, as I've mentioned. A neighbourhood watch area is a safe area, and that has an impact on the value of their houses, or perhaps as a tool to increase social interaction. However, neighbourhood watch developed a reputation of being an organisation of nosy parkers and curtain twitchers. And we realised that we had to move away from that stereotyping and move into the 21st century and embrace social media. So we are on Facebook and Twitter. So where are we today? We have 173,000 schemes in England and Wales, each with its own coordinator, and an average of around 220 homes in each uh, uh, scheme. We have around 3.8 million household members. 25% of schemes are in the top 10% of residentially affluent areas, whilst only 6% are at the bottom 10% of such areas. Most members are male and tend to be over 50 years of age. We have a small staff of five, based in Leicester, about 100 miles north of London. The rest of the work is done entirely by volunteers. I'm a volunteer and the rest of the trustees are volunteers. But we live in a changing world. The world has changed in the last 30 years the World Wide Web, computer technology, and the way we communicate with each other has changed. 
and the internet has become our preferred means of communication. There has also been a change in criminal behaviour. Some of it has been a result of our successes, target hardening and property marking have had an impact. But criminals have also changed their habits. This is the age of the confidence trickster, the hustler. It is the era of cybercrime, human trafficking and child sexual exploitation. And we must move with the times. International terrorism, as we've seen, is not going to go away and we have to be alert to the challenges it poses. We need to give people the opportunity to communicate with each other, both online and face to face. Local communities are still important, but so are online groups, community interest groups, faith groups, residents associations and sports clubs. And we, we classify these as virtual nature projects. When the movement started, printed newsletters and public meetings were the way that the police communicated with members. By then, a lot of the crime data was out of date. Neighbour Watch is not spying on your neighbour. It is being aware of who your neighbour is, looking out for them in difficult times, and recognising strangers and those who don't fit in. We're not agents of the police. We are not run by the police. We are independent organisations supported by the police and local councils. In fact, most of the funding for local groups comes from local councils. In the United Kingdom, we are very proud of policing structures. We have fully adopted the concept of policing by consent. In 1829, Sir Robert Peel, the then Home Secretary of England and Wales, and founder of the Metropolitan Police said, the people are the police and the police are the people. And this is true today as it was nearly 200 years ago. Just as we have had to change with our method of communication and embrace the digital age, we've had to change our position within the community. We are more about community cohesion. We are developing communities where neighbors talk to each other, where we look out for our vulnerable members, those who are isolated and lonely. This might mean doing their shopping or collecting medicines from the pharmacy. I speak to my neighbour next door because she looks after my cat when I'm in Brussels. Mm -hmm. The effect is that there is an improvement in our quality of life. The community comes together and there is change in the overall perception of the area. Criminals get a feeling that they are not welcome, that they, are, that they run the risk of being identified and therefore crime and antisocial behaviour diminishes. And so it goes on. Thank you. Perfect timing, by the way, so thank you. But now it's time for uh, Alex Neumann. Yeah, Jim touched upon uh, a lot of issues. I would like to come back uh, in my talk uh, about how uh, the research we've done in the IRIS project, so this is the second <coughs> end of the IRIS project, IRIS Increasing Resilience in Surveillance, societies, you can hear from the title of the project, there are some implications about the society we are living in, a surveillance society. Uh, and uh, Jin made some, already some remarks on how this uh, practice, uh, neighbor watching, is, is conducted in the UK. And I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how it doesn't work in other parts uh, of the world, and then Joachim will uh, draw a more broader global picture on Yes, and I think uh, it was failure. Um, but before I do this, I would like to give you a brief input about uh, what this project um, uh, was about, what it actually touched on. <coughs> the neighbor watch teams uh, asking questions about who is watching, who is being watched. Uh, you already mentioned watching online, so the virtual dimension is, uh, is key, which is very interesting, also in the context of this uh, uh, conference here. Um, and then trying to answer the question of the comparison of legal watch as a security self-management instrument for our practice. So those of you who are from the, uh, as uh, Chiara mentioned this in her introduction, from the surveillance studies community, this is a very common assumption about the world we currently <laughs> living in, uh, that surveillance has developed into a, a dominant strategy uh, how to prevent, how to tackle and fight crime uh, and criminal uh, activities and terrorism. And you all know um, the developments from the 9th, uh, uh, 9th uh, September uh, 2001, uh, 11th September 2001. Uh, as a starting point, you can take and uh, lots of things, lots of measures were implemented all across uh, uh, the world. And it started, let's say, at the, at the airports. And when we go 
back home, those uh, which were not from Brussels, we go to uh, security checks and lots of books that you've written about the security measures um, <coughs> trying to um, explain so uh, what we're actually doing here, this kind of security theater is that the catchphrase here. Uh, uh, and of course, what was fiction, let's say, 15 years ago in, in Hollywood news, you see here Tom Cruise from the uh, almost infamous picture, uh, Minority Report, based on the novelist that now with uh, uh, the capacities that not only law enforcement uh, units, but also private companies have to um, collect data, profile data, uh, um, that we're moving towards uh, this surveillance society already living in, in a surveillance society. And the second assumption, or big assumption of this uh, project to give you a little bit of the framework, is that um, surveillance is not only a method to address crime and terrorism uh, and, and prevent um, these kind of things that happen, is that surveillance also uh, is already a side effect of our electronic mediated society or culture, uh, so to speak. You can think of a lot of private companies who are collecting data about you, think about your loyalty cards when you go shopping. The first question is, do uh, you have your loyalty card? Do you pay cash or you like to pay with credit card and then of course the virtual dimension so that's my professional self uh, if you like to follow me on, uh, on Twitter please uh, do so uh, so that's the virtual image uh, of uh, the researcher of the part of me that's a that's a researcher and we are connected uh, over all these uh, various net networks and what I would like to talk about in the, the second half of my, of my little talk here is about how these schemes started to you know enter the web and, and, and what is happening um, so Neighbor Watch, that was one of the uh, surveillance uh, practices we were uh, looking at in IRIS. Before there was a panel on, uh, on AMPR, we did look into credit score. Uh, it was on credit score in the morning with something on, on, on AMPR, um, uh, subject access requests. And the interesting thing of this, about this project was that we were able to look at these various what we call surveillance practices all across um, Europe. So there were many countries lots of partners uh, involved there and the Neighbor Watch uh, uh, study was done in the UK by the University of Stirling and the Open University uh, for Spain, the University of Barcelona. Um, our institute we are representing uh, here from, from Austria and in Germany we had the University of Hamburg and the University of Munich which was for Germany very important because Germany is in European context a rather big uh, country and there are, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, lots of differences. Uh, how this is done in, um, in Germany. And why we choose uh, um, an able watch scheme, because normally what I've talked about initially is that surveillance practices are normal, you know, organized in a, in a vertical manner. So the state law enforcement units uh, watching about uh, citizens, watching suspicious uh, individuals making profiles, saying to companies. Uh, and we were interesting about what is in the literature described as horizontal um, surveillance. So people watching people, neighbors watching, and neighbors, neighbors taking care uh, about each, uh, each other. Uh, and that's the right reason why we picked um, uh, this case. The name Kitty Genoese, Genoese was already mentioned as the, what is normally described in the literature as the origins of, of, of neighborhood watch. And I'm, I'm sure Joachim will uh, go much more into detail. So I would like to give you uh, just a brief timeline when this all started in the 1960s in uh, New York a community-based response to, to uh, a, a murder, a case of murder. Uh, and then Spain is one of the countries in our study, uh, right after the end of the, 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 the uh, dictatorship, uh, ad hoc citizen patrol, patrols. So Spain was, you know, developing a democracy, uh, a democratic, uh, as a democratic country. Uh, there are uh, ad hoc citizens patrols taking over duties of the um, of the police, uh, also in urban areas, uh, also in, uh, in rural areas, not only in, in urban areas. So that's in the late uh, 1970s. And uh, Jim already mentioned that in the UK, um, what started in the uh, in the in the states in the 1960s was adopted in the in the 1980s. So more than 30 years ago. In northern Germany, you find uh, first examples of adopting this, you know, Anglo-American uh, tradition of neighbor watch schemes in the late 1980s. Southern Germany is a, is a different story. And then there's Austria, or Vienna is the larger uh, urban area there, where you had 
first attempts to establish this kind of schemes in the late 1990s and then uh, they disappeared. And since 2007 in Austria, there is one scheme in the, in the Anglo-American tradition uh, established and that was in the, in the focus of our uh, research in, in the IRIS project. Um, so who is watching? We heard about that, uh, and I think that was all your, also James' uh, last statement, in, in the UK, Neighborhood Watch is very much connected with uh, the idea of community safety, so to speak, a, a British uh, success story. It's a long history of police and community, community uh, relations and taking care of each other, looking uh, for each other. In Spain, uh, there's a different um, history and development of neighborhood watch, watch schemes. Uh, in the very uh, early 1990s, uh, in, in big cities in, in Spain, uh, it was investigated by colleagues from the Barcelona University that neighborhood watch schemes were um, implemented to tackle drug related crime problems. So, heroin was um, a big issue there in the, in the early 90s. And, um, these schemes uh, had a very bad reputation because they tended to, to act very violently towards um, uh, drug users, drug dealers, and literally kick them out of the buses, kick them out of the, the area. So they had a very bad reputation. Uh, drug problems were partly solved in, uh, in Spain, uh, or heroin started to disappear as a, as a global trend. And Chiara saying me five minutes, so I have to hurry up. You see uh, a change uh, in Spain in the early 2000s. Burglary becomes uh, a topic for these this schemes uh, since the financial crisis hit Spain very hard in 2007. Um, farmers in rural areas began to patrol to protect their livestock, their copper, their tools, uh, and so on. And in the recent past, um, there are examples for human rights uh, watch, um, uh, um, citizens watching the police at demonstrations, at football games, at all kinds of uh, events. Um, Germany, there are uh, in initiatives all across uh, Germany. Crime control is very similar to the to the UK phenomenon. phenomenon uh, UK um, uh, example, uh, a minor phenomenon. Uh, it is more about, as I said before, about community safety, quality of life, uh, people living in an area, gathering together, um, try to take care of each other. And then we have the, the Austrian case where we since 2007, Austria has something like 8 million inhabitants at the moment. Uh, there are 6,000 registered watchers, um, but they're not patrolling uh, the street. There's a loose or almost no cooperation with uh, local police um, authorities, and they're trying to adopt this um, Anglo American uh, idea in Austria. So, how do these schemes emerge? We heard that for the UK, of course, there's a long history community relations and taking care uh, for, for your neighbors and looking after each other. That's half true for, um, for Germany, but Joachim probably can go there much more into detail. And then in Austria and Spain, where there's no legal basis for this scheme. So in, in the UK, if you'd like to, to start or apply <coughs> to become uh, part of the uh, neighborhood watch scheme, uh, there's a clear regulation for it, how this, how this works and the police uh, uh, treats, I guess, uh, neighbor watch scheme as part of their community safety, uh, community security work. And especially in Austria, um, it's an outcome of frustration with the police effectiveness. You know, calling the police, I've seen a white van driving around my neighborhood, I've seen suspicious people walking around my neighborhood, and nothing happens. And what the research has shown in these countries where it's not you know, part of the police work, it's not part of the, the strategy, the policing strategy, it's need, it needs the, the entrepreneur uh, to get such a scheme uh, started. Which mostly it's uh, one or two persons who bring this idea forward, uh, start such a scheme, can be ad hoc schemes, disappear after a short period of time, um, but that, uh, that is sometimes very important that they are, that they are allowed to know. So, we have this, uh, uh, but only in Spain, uh, uh, discovered this um, new form of neighborhood watch teams that are observing human rights compliance of the police, law enforcement units at, let's say, bigger sports events, gatherings, demonstrations, and so on. You see the picture there, then you know, wearing their, their little uniform, uh, and you can report to them, and they then uh, report to um, uh, legal, uh, legal authorities if a uh, violation happens. But that is only something we discovered in Spain. Coming to the online dimension, I guess I have something like two or three minutes um, left. Um, I admit sometimes I Google myself. 
I'm not sure if you're doing this. Uh, of course, this is German, but I've highlighted here in blue. This is from the online forum, from the blog of the Neighbors Watch, watch Scheme in, in uh, Austria, where they're discussing uh, my person. So, uh, Mr. Neumann, we're learning something here, but uh, Austrians, Austrians love titles. Although I only have an MA in sociology, I'm here named with my, my title, so it's a little cultural. Uh, thing with Austin. So they're discussing whether I'm a trustworthy person, uh, person is not what they're saying. I can translate now. I'm a nice person. It's okay to speak to me. Next topic is about uh, fraud on, uh, on, on street level and people are discussing these kind of uh, things in, in the online blog. And of course they have a Facebook it's a pro neighbor phone number. That's the, um, the neighbor watch scheme we were talking about in Austria. They have an, uh, a Facebook appearance where they can upload, users can upload uh, photos of a crime scene or car that was broken uh, up uh, and uh, that's the big debate in Austria they are having with the police is that the neighborhood watch scheme would like to have access to police data to know where uh, a crime happened in the area to inform uh, their, their, uh, uh, their neighbors uh, to take care. So they are doing this by themselves. Police says okay for data pro protection uh, reason we can't share this data uh, with you, we're sorry, but please report. So they are doing their own crime mapping. Uh, in a more sophisticated way, doing this crime mapping, we find examples in Spain or all uh, over the world. There is this uh, infamous uh, blog or website and, and WhatsApp group robbed in Barcelona, um, but not uh, you know, founded by uh, people from Barcelona, it's by foreigners living uh, in Barcelona, and that happened to them. So uh, it's very easy with Google Maps to yeah, provide this kind of crime maps, this rotten, rotten neighbor kind of thing you probably uh, heard about. Uh, and they're making lists of the most dangerous places in, in uh, Barcelona. So they become sort of a data controller there, collecting all sorts of data. And we we come to the last three slides in a hurry up. Um, what I call controversial that we uh, can discuss afterwards uh, about these, these schemes. Of course, these online groups are not neighborhood to watch schemes as uh, Explained by James uh, in, the, in the UK case, they're more ad hoc community safety security group. But what you find here, first hypothesis is the stigmatization or re stigmatization of already disadvantaged target groups. If you look uh, at the picture that's chosen of the man, of the, uh, of the robber who's, who's doing this, it creates a certain image about who are the, who are the groups, who are the bad guys, who are the, uh, the good guys. Um, the idea of the white van driving across uh, your neighborhood is all across Europe, the, the number plates differ in Austria. It's an Eastern European number plate, and the uh, UK is a different number plate, and so on. Normalization of so, uh, surveillance. Um, that's one uh, hypothesis of the, the project of this surveillance practice uh, have an impact on, on societies. Um, in the UK, we have a long history of uh, CCTV cameras being installed all across uh, the country. That's uh, happening now in other countries uh, in Europe and they're you know, speeding up. Uh, as I said, in Germany um, it's difficult uh, because of the, of the uh, history of this country. Austria had almost the same history but we denied. Hitler was German, he was not Austrian, so we found an easy way out of this uh, discussion. Neither did the, neither did the, did the Germans. So for Germany, if groups gather and say, okay, we take care about uh, our neighbors' uh, community safety approach, security approaches. They treat it suspicious. Uh, they treat it suspicious because of the history, of the, the recent history of these countries. In Austria, there's no legal reference to neighborhood watch schemes uh, in relation to crime policing. So Austrian police, the official, official position from Austrian police would be, we don't, we don't cooperate with this kind of, uh, with those kind of people. We, the police, uh, According to the, the law and the books, are those who are uh, entitled to deal with uh, uh, these issues. And last slide: um, privacy infringement. Open for the discussion. You remember the, the Boston bombings and uh, the investigation that citizens, not the neighbor watch scheme, that citizens started to do uh, online. Uh, so there's no necessary necessity or more to meet and gather and become a group. You can do this online via via services like Reddit. Uh, and try to, to start your own investigations uh, on the crime scene, like in the Boston bombing. And you've seen this with Facebook, and I have to stop now. Yes. There are a lot, lot of, of, of questions about the content of this conference, of the privacy infringement.
arrangements, or who's the data controller, is it the scheme, is it the user, is it the service uh, provider? And I think I have to stop. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, okay, now Joachim. So, <clears throat> well, Sting is the police. I am not the police. Um, so I was a professor at the police university for MI students, for senior police uh, management. So my son wrote this morning, since when do police data protection? When I send him a uh, screenshot of the conference flyer. Um, so I am not the police. I just taught there because I couldn't get anywhere else to a decent university. So. Um, my background, Canadian, MA, Australian, uh, instructor, or university teacher of criminology, Japan, research for a year and a half and two years in Evanston, Illinois, in the USA, near Chicago. So I'm a comparative studies social scientist, and so I hope you won't be disappointed when I, don't, when I don't, can't tell you details about um, the working of Neighborhood Watch in Germany, I think uh, we have a, next slide please, thank you Chiara. This is Australia, Canberra, so you see uh, four faces there, one is a cop, one is a white face, a black face, and a female face. And next one please, and eucalyptus tree of course. Uh, this is more explicit in terms of symbolism. Uh, you have a black person in uh, Mississippi. Um, well, I leave it to you to do an interpretation in the next one please. This is North Carolina. Uh, these are houses, roofs of houses. And above you see a, a, a the white of a, could be a black eye, um, but I'm not sure. So the next one, please. We have this problem in Germany, I think still, not only people of my generation, that the Blockbach system, the lowest rank uh, Nazi party uh, functionaries. Um, there were um, about, 200,000 of them in 1935. They were responsible to survey about 60 to 70 families in the house or the region where they live. And in 1939, there were two million of them. Their main job was spying on neighbors and spying on enemies of the Führer and um, reporting on Jews and people who liked Jews or who helped Jews. And the information that went from there to the Gestapo was uh, incremental for the success of uh, the Gestapo in crime funding. Without this information, um, they wouldn't have been so successful in, in detaining people, arresting people, uh, tortur uh, torturing and murdering people. So as a German, we have a problem with this, as you may understand. I found a similar system in Japan during my studies where police go to each and every family in the, in the region where they are responsible and interview them. They ask them if they're well, somebody helps them if they're sick. However, it's also finding out about terrorists, Japanese terrorists, um, if they have any links, if they have any information. So it is a data gathering exercise. It's done by foot face to face. Uh, maybe it is more advanced and sophisticated now in the dig digital age. Um, one important point for comparative view is that Neighborhood Watch comes from common law cultures. And they differ in the relationship between citizen, the state, and citizen and the police and state and the police from civil law, Roman law, cultures in continental Europe. And people often forget about this. They look at, at the at advantages or the successes of Neighborhood Watch in the UK or in Ireland or in the US or maybe in Australia, and then they say, oh, let's adapt this. It doesn't work because it's a different thing. Another special case uh, is, is Eastern Europe. We had a meeting at the, uh, the Council of Europe about community policing. And this Hungarian scholar stood up and said, sorry, uh, we had community policing until 1989-90. And, uh, and, and honestly, we are sick and tired of it. So please try, you know, Western Europeans, don't try to talk us into community policing again. We had it. It, it works uh, for the state. Um, so this is something I think you have to keep in mind when you look at this. Um, yeah, this has been mentioned. Kitty Genovese was a non-helping bystander syndrome. People were walking by while the women were screaming for help, being raped, and then murdered. Nobody did anything. This is different from fighting crime. So the origin, in my mind, is not from crime fighting. 
if the origin is from sort of community activity mm. or simple values of humanity, you help your neighbors in the Bible, you know. So uh, the shooting of, uh, of Martin by a neighborhood watch captain in Florida is sort of the end of this sort of crime fighting. This is my boardwalk. This is my front yard. So I use my gun and I kill you because I watch the neighborhood. So this is sort of the negative end of the specter of, of neighborhood watch. watch. And it's different from where it started from. Question is, what is a neighborhood? What is a community? We have done three years of research for the uh, European Union on minorities and policing in Germany, Hungary, and Austria. Um, the community in Berlin, where we did the research, is one of the most difficult communities in Germany. It's called a Turkish community. But if you look a little bit closer, like our interview partners, they were from Lebanon, they were Arabs, they were Kur Kurds, Kurdish people from different parts of, of the regions where Kurds live. There were Alevites, uh, Aleviten from, from <coughs> Turkey. There were more sort of conservatively religious people from Turkey. Very, very different people. Now the main conflicts that they talked about was not with the German majority society or with the police, but with other family clans. About, guess what, money, mainly. Or honor, or other things. So the, this issue, the, this idea of a community as a healthy, coherent, wonderful, uh, kumbaya singing little thing with street parties is a very is a fictitious uh, um, Mickey Mouse image of criminology, which is very persistent, but not real, at least not in the data. So, um, I, when we lived in Evanston, Illinois, there was Skokie. Skokie is a Jewish community. It's Jewish. Most people there are have a Jewish background. <coughs> Vinetka is a neighborhood where Charlton Heston, the president of the uh, National Rifle, the Rifle Association, lived. In his basement, you, there was enough uh, weapons to start the Third World War. Um, completely different, just surrounding Evanston, Evanston's university neighborhood. You cannot compare these places in a in a small circle of about circle of about 25 kilometers. Um, if you look at the French minority quarters, the banlieue, and the German examples, they are entirely different. Um, the people in the banlieue, they do not only hate the police for, for reasons which are understandable, they hate the, the, the majority society. Because they're 35 kilometers away, and there's only one bus every hour going there, which is used by the <coughs> others, who is the only one in the family who has a decent job, maybe cleaning after other people. So um, if you look at this in Germany, it's very different. The migrant neighborhoods are very different from the French neighborhoods. The, uh, the, there's research by Max Planck and the University of Grenoble of uh, how kids, school kids, 17,000, see the police, how often they have been mistreated. Um, it's completely different. In Germany, you have no difference between um, uh, migrant background or German background. In France, there is a huge difference in terms of, 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 of being mistreated, in terms of being uh, complaining about lack of respect, and so on. Of course, the other side, the, the police report similar things. Um, <coughs> so does neighborhood watch reduce crime? I have looked at the results. They are mixed. At best, and they are always from common law countries. I haven't seen any empirical studies done about crime reduction in continental Europe that have convinced me as sort of somewhat serious empirical work. Um, which crimes are reduced? That's important. Is it property crimes? Now, in, in Australia, we lived in a neighborhood watch area. We were break and enter twice. Once in bright daylight, once at night. I didn't even wake up. My wife took the two junkies and sort of like dogs and said, go and get out of here. They didn't do anything. They didn't pull a knife, nothing. This was a neighborhood watch area. Um, my, my friend Steve, I not know him, his video recorder at the time was stolen five times. Then the insurance company said, no, sorry, sir, no cover anymore. Who, by whom? By junkies. By people who are trying to steal things um, because they need money for it. So if you look, it's not neighborhood watch. It's what happens in the drug market and how the society reacts to illegal, illicit drugs and drug taking, what determines crime. Another thing, if you have a lot of trust in police, there's more reporting. 
Unfortunately, this leads to an increase in the, in the reported crime statistics. Then people say, crime's going up. Jesus, what's happening? Police isn't doing anything, you know? Um, so these, all these things are differences that have to be looked at. Now, finally, what we have found out in our project, and this will be my last, my last remarks, um, trust in police arrives on foot and leaves on horseback, or rather leaves with an Audi A8. Um, yeah. yeah. So if people in minority communities report about <coughs> being, being treated very badly by police, like is the case in Hungary, um, in Austria, we had sub-Saharan Africans. There was some reports. It doesn't matter if it happens to yourself or it has happened to your friends or family members or even neighbors. The news spread like a fire, like a bushfire, that police has done something wrong. Um, and then trust in police is gone. Now, if we have cases like Charlie um, at Doe and the cases that have upset us in the last three, four weeks, if minority people do not report because they lack trust in police, we have a very serious problem. I think you have to look at European countries to see where how trust in police differs. There's, there is a survey by, um, by a Finnish colleague of mine, trust in police in 16 European countries. Very, very different. Surprise, surprise, lack of trust in police correlates highly with corruption index, with spending, on social security and education, in a, in a sort of the more you spend, the less, the more trust you have, and it correlates negatively with police numbers and spending on police. Now, as long as this hasn't been explained to me in a very sort of convincing way, I am very <laughs> careful with new schemes of crime fighting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs>
one of uh, you know, <coughs> all my social work, uh, where we do it in, in, in digital times, is that we come up with problems. The rough neighbor was mentioned, and there are a couple of other such cases uh, where people do witch hunt on the web, uh, where suddenly data, new data emerge that are not controlled. Uh, this is a, I think this is uh, something where um, for the, the general frame of if this conference becomes uh, important and uh, you create a set of data, you circulate them, you put them on a, on a website and uh, who's supposed to control them if it's all bottom up, if, if it's all quote unquote spontaneous. You know. So this may be one of the links of the interfaces to the uh, topic of the conference. Um, there's still 20 minutes to go for lunch, so um, we can start a discussion and collect questions. Yes, one, two, three. Question first, which is probably in uh, in the UK, if a 
it, three quarters of the residents of a block of flats or a street or, a, or wherever, <coughs> a village, decide they want to have a, a neighborhood watch scheme in the area, then it will go ahead. Uh, there will be some people who um, don't want to participate, don't want to be part of the community, <coughs> it's entirely a matter for them. And they, but some, somehow in the back of my mind, one asks the question, why don't they want to be? Have they got something to hide? Mm -hmm. are they, <laughs> yeah, maybe they want to be part of the community, but they, they yeah, want did to they be, be Did they become <coughs> watched rather than the watchers? So I, I think that is, um, that is the way it works in the UK. Uh, the lady was talking about Bergenet. Uh, we had a conference in Vienna in October, and we had a presentation then from the deputy chief of uh, police in Amsterdam, and he showed us a, a, a DVD about Bergenet, and it was something that um, I took back to my colleagues in London because I thought it was an excellent scheme. And in English, we have a, a phrase which means steal other people's ideas with pride. Don't be ashamed of uh, the plagiarism because it's always happens. <coughs> so um, that is something that we're looking at again, and I, I thought it was a very interesting uh, program. The way it worked was very good. I don't know if there's anything else that anybody wants me to talk about particularly, but... Uh, no, so I'll just yeah. I'd like to come back to uh, first to your question uh, on, on uh, this German-specific question. We could talk over lunch about it. What the colleagues figured out in, in their report, you know, that was done in, in Hamburg and in Munich, that in, in northern Germany uh, the community safety idea of these schemes is, is much more adopted or much more liked by by the neighbors than in southern Germany, like in, in Bavaria or. Munich was described that it was very difficult for these schemes um, to implement this, for the change that this original idea of, of looking uh, after each other, taking care of the neighbor's cats, that was for, for cultural reasons uh, difficult there to, to implement there. Of course, the compliance with the police is almost the same uh, between northern and, and southern uh, Germany, but this community safety aspect is in our report described to be you know, working better in, in northern Germany. Uh, that was the difference. And then the most interesting question, uh, or more, uh, very interesting question from you on, on how to opt out uh, and how to overcome uh, the previous implication of if you're living in a, in a neighborhood area. What I did in our study, I spent a couple of days with neighborhood watchers going around the areas, visiting uh, there at home, and you know, try to talk with the neighbor across the fence, uh, or talk with people who live in a, in a neighborhood watch area, and that is exactly. Uh, the issue, especially in countries like in, in Austria, where it's not that common or doesn't have this long, long uh, background as it has in the, in the UK, um, that the neighborhood watches themselves are considered to be suspicious uh, people. We heard about this block art system, the Nazi regime, and that is still something. Um, but also, we don't talk about these times anymore. Not the old, not the young generation, but it gets this certain smell. In the groups start to develop, to develop this, and mostly in, in, in Austria or in southern Germany, it's a very narrow communities uh, of people living in a, in a nice uh, neighborhood, uh, not in the city center. It's not the, the youngsters in the city center. It's having this, this yeah. Common law and Roman law. Common law is, is based on precedent. If something has happened, there has been a decision, and these, the, these decisions are kept and are the basis for further decisions. Uh, Roman law is codified law. It's like Ikea bookshelves. Everything is in a box, and you have the box property crime, you have a box sexual offenses, you have a different, different boxes. And this is not just uh, the, the order of law, it is also, it forms also the mental hygiene of people living in these systems. And there are differences between the UK and continental European systems. Now, coming to um, East Germany, they called it House Vertrauensmann, a word that Mark Twain would have loved. It means sort of house confidence, not con man, but <laughs> confidence uh, man or warden. That was the equivalent of what, what the Blockwart was um, in the Nazi times, namely the one reporting to the police and to the party. Now, these guys were party members, of course, and then in the house you had these informal Informants. So it's, it's by German, it's seen as a snitch system. Now, police and neighborhood watch. 
in, in North, you know, we have um, eight, um, 16 lender police and three federal police, and they, it's like in the olden times, you know, before modernization, they, they don't want to merge. Um, they have been, uh, there has been an investigation why they failed so dramatically uh, against the right-wing terrorists who killed, uh, killed so many people, um, and, and this is because of, of um, incompetence and these kinds of territorial claims. This is my frontier. You go away, I'll shoot you. And police seem to think in the same in the same dimensions. Now, there were these. We did an in-service training for public relations officers for all over Germany uh, three years ago, maybe four, but I think three years ago. There was an audience of about fifty, and there was this Waldorf and Stetson group, like <coughs> some of us here. <laughs> you know, uh, this is from the Muppet Show. The guys who are sitting on the balcony, uh, and. and there were younger guys. Now this um, this speaker was introducing the app system in North Rhine Westphalia. This was they were testing it, apps, establishing links between citizen and police. And I was sitting among the Waldorf and Stetson group, and so this guy said to me, hey, "Can you ask Can you ask him, the speaker, to explain to us what an app is?" <laughs> <laughs> police officers in their fifties, mid fifties, they didn't know what it was. This tells you something about the. Um, this is something for specialists, but in sort of practical policing on the streets, this has very little significance. And so, uh, this is, I think, what I wanted to say. We are somewhat associated to the uh, secure zones. In our research on, in Hungary, you found, of course, the. Um, if you want to call them neighborhood watch, I don't know. I wouldn't. Um, if I were Hungarian, they have uniforms, <coughs> and the uniforms are the ones that they also wore um, during the fascist times uh, when they collaborated with Hitler. And they go into the Roma villages to make to create secure zones by threatening people. And this is sort of this is not 1942. Uh, this is 2014 um, in Orbán's new wonderful Hungary. Um, and the Jobbik party has nearly 20% of, of the votes in, in Hungary. And they are openly anti-Semitic, homophobic, misogynist, and so on. So in these countries, I don't think in Europe now we have a stable situation where we can say, oh, we can trust the people. <coughs> oh, they have nice communities. Uh, they are all Democrats. Please excuse my skepticism. <laughs> Okay, there's two, two issues still not answered. This is one with the citizen access to police data. Would that be a part of, of would that be, can it be integrated as a part of established? It's and the other one is there any privacy? I mean, we have this data, you know, proliferation of uh, personal data through neighborhood watch websites. Is there a policy or a standard to, to minimize the effects of the this to get this into some privacy machine. Uh, in, in the UK, um, the data protection legislation is very strict, and if uh, let information is shared incorrectly, the information commissioner will, will, will jump very hard on people that do. Um, there are ways in which neighborhood watch people can become um, police service volunteers. In which case they go through the normal scrutiny, uh, their background is checked uh, very thoroughly, and if they're approved, they have access uh, and help in police stations. Uh, and one of the ways they do that is by disseminating information regarding crime trends <coughs> to the local community, um, which is very much redacted. The identity of the victim is always taken out. Um, a location. Um, in the UK we have uh, postcodes, zip codes, whatever, and so it would show just a, a small area um, where a particular crime has, has happened, which can help the police get information about who might be responsible for that crime, but by the same token it allows uh, neighbourhood watch groups to take the appropriate action to how they can prevent further crimes of that type taking place. So if, uh, to give an example, if um, there is a, a, a row of houses with a, a, an alley 
uh, at the back, uh, and all the burglars are coming, going down the alley and climbing over the back fences to gain access into the houses rather than coming in through the front door. Um, then they can take security measures to improve the security mm -hmm. of the alley, and the, we call that alley gating. But is, are you saying that uh, if you set up a neighborhood watch scheme and that is under the regime of the information commissioner, yes, you have to register there? And no, it, it, it is registered locally with the uh, the local the local police and the local authority. Uh, but if they want fur to take it further, they have to. Because this more or less quote unquote spontaneous uh, groupings that pop up in some areas in Germany and Austria, they don't, they don't have any data protection. Right? They, they, have to go, they have to go through certain, through certain accreditation processes to make sure they're bona fide and they're not, they're not doing it for ulterior motives. But it, in general, it, the idea is to bring the community together where they talk to each other, where they look after people's cats and the old people who might, uh, when it's very cold, and uh, who might not be able to go out to do <coughs> their shopping. So I've got uh, Keith, uh, you, and um, David. One, two, three, four. Um, this one's for James. Uh, in your talk, you mentioned recognizing those that don't fit in. Mm -hmm. You're staring in five minutes. What, uh, what does that mean, recognizing those that don't fit in? And, uh, to me, it sounds slightly dangerous. And I, I wonder about accusing Genevieve. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about the <coughs> details about the murder. But I wonder who she was killed by, was it a neighbor or the yes. It was a neighbor called Winston Mosley. Yes. Do you want to do all the questions? Yeah, I just will collect the question and we may be brief. I'd like just to go and say that uh, kind of mind experiment, so let's go 30 years forward. What would you prefer? Would you prefer having lots of neighborhood watches collaborating with the police? Would you prefer no neighborhood watches but police with surveillance cameras everywhere? So you have the choice of either having, let's say, amateurish neighborhood watch people for watching the neighborhood, or you have professional but somewhat limited surveillance by police, by cameras, by drones, by don't know what else. Technology means that you support police in having a spot on those places that the neighborhood watch right now compensate. That's a tick the box question, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Richard. Yeah, I, mean, I have various comments from a sort of chronological perspective, but to keep it brief, and since we're almost at lunchtime, I, just, I guess I just want to say one thing, which is that I wonder what the relationship between um, traditional forms of neighborhood watch might be, and perhaps to say next generation of um, digitally sort of informed community policing. And I say that in particular because many police forces around the world at the moment are considering embarking on huge spending plans. Uh, the New Zealand police, for example, have recently equipped all 15,000 members of the police force with an iPad or um, uh, an iPhone. And this is part of um, a system of kind of information management, and this is very popular with uh, police managers uh, for all sorts of reasons. But it does raise the question is exactly how this information is going to be used. And of course, there are various kind of surveillance potential involved. So although the desire has been in part to try to use the likes of Twitter to rejoin communities and police, in fact, the empirical research shows that the most popular app that the police use when you give them an iPhone or a tablet is to look up um, license plate details or to do searches on the police national computer. In other words, very traditional forms of reactive policing. So I guess that's one of the challenges <coughs> that we might see in this kind of next generation way. Rowena. Um, yeah, it, it might sound a bit silly, but what, one of the things that struck me is you said that there's a certain type of membership involved, which is males over 50. And that freaks me out more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think the whole initiative is fine, but could you comment on what impacts this has on the efficiency or effectiveness of neighborhood watch? I mean, that just, that's right, right. that just strikes me as very bizarre. Is there some sort of explanation for it? <laughs> when you talk about efficiency, uh, have you ever tried to stop to to women, not to mention men, stop talking. <laughs> Have you ever tried? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's let me quickly I'll, I'll answer. Yeah. I think the, the reason I would say that it's more older men is because the younger genera generation is, have, are very busy, they have a day job,
they don't have time to get involved, and likewise with the women, they are very busy. So I'm responding to your gender-specific question. I think the, perhaps the older men have got more time, and therefore they can. So that, that's my excuse. Um, going back to the question about if they don't fit in, if I come out of my apartment and I see somebody who I don't recognise, I will say, good morning, can I help you? In a way that, um, re acknowledging that they're not part of the group where I, the area where I live. I live <coughs> a small development with 27 dwellings, so I hope I know everybody who lives there. And they might say, I've, come, I've got a parcel for Jim, or I've come to do this or that or the other, and I say, fine, thank you, carry on. But it's acknowledging that there are some people who uh, might go into an area uh, for unlawful purposes. That's what I mean by don't fit in. Perhaps it was a bit abbreviated, <coughs> conscious at the time. But the danger might be within. Because what? what the danger may be within. Within, within yeah. indeed, yes. Yeah. 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 Alex. I'd like to combine and, and answer your question about the, the yeah, future. Yeah, you haven't given me any layer, a uh, uh, suggestion of a layer that might be social, contextually relevant to this situation. Yeah. Yeah. To combine and, and answer on the, the question about what the, is the future of community policing and security in public areas and Keith's perspective on, uh, sorry, uh, Richard's perspective on uh, how the police would deal with all these tools we have now, uh, online tools. And, um, I think probably not in 30 years' time, but my prediction for the future would be in five years' time. Um, there's a strong, you know, police trying to, to, to get more and more citizens involved in this kind of uh, security reporting uh, apps. And I've been in development, the uh, process of developing such an, an app where citizens can uh, report, as you said, for the younger generations, these schemes seem not to be as attractive, but they create these ad hoc groups like Rob in Barcelona, Rob in Vienna, and whatsoever. Uh, police trying you know, to, you know, to, to move this, uh, uh, these developments, these ad hoc online groups into applications uh, for smartphones, tablets and so on, which in a way are more control or controllable and moderatable for the, um, for the police. And I guess that would be my prediction for the future, that we see more and more citizens coping with police uh, apps and that we get this old idea of, you know, uh, overcome the civil uh, inactiveness uh, that was you know, shown in the, in the Kitty Generator case uh, into uh, this, this uh, police and, and um, citizens application. That would be my, my take point. Crime. Sorry. Crime is down in my country for the last <coughs> 15 years. Um, it's not a priority. Terrorism is, radicalization is. CCTV uh, police are never watched. Is not, I don't think that's the right uh, formula. Um, because police, police efficiency in crime fighting is nothing much to shout about. And, uh, so I think that this creates a wrong kind of... Uh, I look at the literature, because I'm a good boy, I thought I'd go to this international conference and I shouldn't look at the research. I did. There is, if you look at Google Scholar or other, other schemes, search engines, there is a difference between pre <coughs> um, Trayvon Martin and post. The number of publications in, in, in scholarly media and also in print media has risen dramatically after the shooting of, um, of Martin by Maywood Watch Captain Zimmerman. Um, there is a, an awareness of the debate going on. I think I read one article that said we need more certified schemes if we do Maywood Watch. We need to check out the people who do it. And we need to be very careful with the connection to the police. So I think that the climate is changing. Finally, gender, this is a very good question. In our research, the migrant, the minority women had trust in police, even if they had bad experiences. Men, males between 15 and 25, no. Um, so at least these kinds of things you have to consider when you create these schemes, at least for, for minority neighborhoods. So thank you very much. One final word. I was just going to. Overall, we haven't talked about money in the current climate. I think uh, we have to always bear, <laughs> bear in mind the uh, state of the economy in most of the countries and the need to be saving funds. And that's where the citizen yep. comes into it. So, so when you leave, please give generously. <laughs>